to uh, our morning service. So obviously, we come here every Lord's Day, and it's the best day of the week, isn't it, to bring our worship to God. And we especially welcome you if you're visiting. We know the family and friends of Luke and Miriam, as uh, Emily's. We have the joy of baptizing Emily today. So welcome to all of you. I'm, not, I'm going to keep the notice to the minimum, but they're on the screen behind me just to say, yes, we'll meet this afternoon, God willing, at 4.15. Uh, Wednesday for Bible study, Thursday prayer for power, 9 to 9.30, and next Sunday at 10.30 and 4.15. You should have received one of the weekly bulletins. That's got lots of information in with regard to meetings uh, dates for your diary and also prayers for the week ahead. just want to mention a couple of things that were, may not be in there. Um, and one is that um, there are camps at this time. The Angelaki family, minus Julian, uh, Dad, he's here somewhere, I think he'll join him later. They, they begin their, their camp tomorrow in Romania. So please be in prayer for that young people's camp. And also our own Alex Parkinson will be going to a camp and uh, be a tent leader in Wales next Saturday, if you could particularly remember them in prayer. I'm going to read, uh, I should just say afterwards, of course, you'll have seen the plenty of refreshments. Please join us uh, for time together after the service this morning. Again, very welcome. I'm going to read, actually, from the last psalm. Uh, we've been saying in the church recently, we're into a bit of a psalm season. Uh, all our visiting preachers seem to be uh, taking us to the Psalms. Well, what a great book to turn to, especially to begin worship. So I'm going to read, just simply read, without any further comment, the opening, well, the words of the whole Psalm 150. So this is the final Psalm, uh, a Psalm of praise, which uh, is a good Psalm to read as we come to worship. <coughs> praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Maybe we could all say that. Praise the Lord together. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. That's a great start, isn't it? <coughs> Let's um, begin by uh, singing our, our first hymn, which will appear on the screens. We sing the almighty power of God.
Father, it is good for us to be here and to raise our voices in your praise. We thank you, Lord, for the Psalms which give us that opportunity to mouth words that were written centuries ago by the psalmists, but still ring true because you are the Lord and you do not change. And so here we are in this part of our country of England on this, the first day of the week, and we are singing songs, we are reading psalms which have been sung or read for centuries, but still ring true. Lord, we thank you that you are the great creator of the ends of the earth. We thank you, Lord, that all that we see around us, we can say truly that you are a great and awesome God who has made all things, and indeed, Lord, who sustained all things by the word of your power. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us in your image and likeness. We are your creatures, Lord. We thank you for your mercy towards us in giving us this another opportunity of gathering together to worship you. And we thank you, Lord, for this again the first day of the week. And we do not tire, Lord, of reminding ourselves that this is the first day of the week, the day we remember the Lord Jesus Christ having died, rose again, and is alive forevermore. So, Lord, may it fill our hearts with joy to be able to gather in this way, <coughs> to worship you with one another, and to be able to pray together, read your word, and hear your word preached. We thank you, Lord, for this day and for the special, extra special opportunity that we have today of being able to be here to witness the baptism of Emily. And we praise you, Lord, for her and for your grace and mercy to her in the gospel and for bringing her to this point where she has come to put her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and wishes to acknowledge that publicly by baptism. So Lord we pray that this will be for her and her family and the whole church family a day of joy and blessing and encouragement. We, co we commit Amity to you Lord and pray that you'll be gracious to her today and in the rest of her days, as she honours and serves and follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Graciously hear us then, we pray, for his sake. Amen. Amen. I want to just say a few things about baptism. Um, as I look around the room, I guess most people, I won't ask for hands to go, most people have been to uh, a baptism, um, and obviously very visual, um, it's there at the, at the front of the room. Um, someone I know not too far away in a building not too far away in a chapel not too far away from here uh, tells me that um, from time to time they have children uh, looking around the, um, around the chapel and uh, the story goes on one occasion these school, school children were looking around and one of the uh, boys I think it was heard to say remember this was in Yorkshire and he was heard to say there's not here and I just interpret that for those that <laughs> there is there is nothing here. Uh, I think what he meant really was that as he looked round, he didn't see um, anything really visual. Although it's a rather nice chapel, I'll tell you about it later if you if you like to know. But we're very much the same here. As you look round, I think this little lad would look round here, and uh, he'd be even more readily say, "There's no pier." Uh, that there's no cross, there are no pictures, there's no static stained glass windows, and there are no icons. So, in a sense, as a church, we really, we don't really do the visual in terms of worship, with two exceptions. And Emily is going to be baptised today, and then next week she will take for the first time the Lord's Supper. So we have the Lord's Supper, very visual, isn't it? Because we have bread. And we have wine, which represents the body and blood of Christ. But here's another visual today, because here we have a baptismal pool. Yeah. Here it is before us, and uh, I just, I've said this many times before, it's not holy water, if there is such a thing. It's just ordinary tap water. But here we have it before us, and it's, I suppose, if you imagine it's a kind, it's like a grave, really. Because Emily is going to be uh, baptised, she's going to be put under the water and she's going to be brought up again quickly. And this is a picture or a symbol of what's happened to her. That uh, she's died to her old life and risen to a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
who she's come to trust as her saviour and lord but all her sins have been washed away through the blood of the lord jesus christ that's happened it's happened and she'll tell her her own story in a few in a few minutes it's happened to amelie and she wants to say to you uh, men and women uh, friends family church family she wants to say to you i am a christian and i want to identify with jesus christ i want to live all my life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as a church, we're so pleased, aren't we? So glad that Amelie has uh, come to this uh, place. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, is it three months ago, um, we baptised Isla, and Isla, Isla is 11. And I, th- I said on that occasion, so far as I know, with the church is 183 years old. Of course, I haven't been there here all that time, but, um, so far as I know in the history of the church, um, uh, Isla was the youngest ever person to be baptised at 11. Well, she hasn't long been the youngest member of the church because Amelie baptised today at 10 will be the youngest member of the church. I think, again, I've said this on other occasions, uh, we, we Baptists were sometimes challenged by others and say, oh, you're the ones that believe in, in adult baptism, aren't you? And I said, no, 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 no. We believe in believer's baptism. Yes. So if a person is very young but has what I call a credible profession of faith, yes. we are happy to baptise them on the profession of that faith. Now, Amelie, um, she's going she's gonna to come and uh, give her testimony, tell us just a few things that what's brought to this point. So thank you, Amber. The, the mic's there. Just for you.
Just to say that any of the children, if you want to come, there are seats on the front row. If you, you can come and stand at the front if you wish. If you're very small and you want to come and see things uh, a bit clearer, then you, you're very welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. to see you. If you don't know me, my name's Lee. I'm one of the other leaders of the church. I also happen to be Amelie's dad. Uh, so it's a great dad. Privilege and honour for me to be standing here with her. I'm going to ask her a couple of questions, which we've agreed on beforehand, which we ask everybody to be clear on her testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and then she's going to answer those. Who's going to take it? So, Emily, do you turn away from your sin against God? Do you trust in Jesus Christ completely to save you? Do you promise to follow Jesus as your Lord for the rest of your life by the strength and grace that the Holy Spirit gives you? And will you serve the Lord Jesus in this church and in the world? Then, Emily, because of your profession of repentance towards God, your faith in the Lord Jesus as your Saviour and Lord, we baptise you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh. Oh. We pray together, Heavenly Father, we worship you and thank you for this happy day, and we rejoice with Emily and what you've done for her, and pray you, that you'd establish her in her young Christian life and make her like her Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us as a church to support and love her, that she might grow into a young woman who is a faithful disciple of Christ for all the rest of her days. Thank you for this honour of being here today. I pray for your blessing on her and on all of us and bring glory to your Son through what we've done today and what will come in the days ahead. We ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing another song as Amy and I get changed. And, uh, and Andrew will continue the rest of the service. So this is called God is a New Beginning, a lovely hymn about the, the new birth and all it means to follow Christ. That's sin.
We're going to read from the scriptures. If you have a Bible, it's uh, the church Bible. It's on page 1028, and it's Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Luke 2, verse 41. This is headed in the, in the New International Version, the boy Jesus at the temple. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to this custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking that he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents <coughs> saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to, Jude, to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. And we thank God for the reading of his word. Rachel is going to come now and uh, lead us in prayer. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for touching Emily with the life-breathing Holy Spirit, breathing your life into her. Help Emily to love you more each day and to see you more clearly as she spends time and devotes herself to the activities that will help her grow, prayer, teaching, fellowship and communion. As we welcome her into the family of God, represented here in the local church, help each of us to be supportive and encouraging to her as she grows in her faith and love for you. May this day stick in her mind as a special day when she professed you as her Lord and Saviour. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 see another song now uh, as you can see uh, you might have picked up there's a bit of a theme uh, going on here this morning with some of the songs so we're thinking about God as creator and of how important that is to remember especially when you're young like Emily we're going to think about that in just a few moments from God's word but uh, this song again is about our creator God and especially how he became one of us in the Lord Jesus Christ and so we're uh, praising him for that now. So we're going to stand to sing Creation Sings the Father's Song.
from God's Word now in the Old Testament and the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is one of what we call the wisdom books, <coughs> after uh, Proverbs and before Song of Songs. If you have a church Bible, you'll find this reading on page 679. 679. And we're going to read the first seven verses of chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And the first seven verses. Let's hear God's words. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach, when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, and the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint, when people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is set and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the, at the spring and the wheel broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground it came from. And the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Amen. We thank God for this word. Now, Amelie is, as Andrew was saying earlier, the second person of around her age <laughs> that we have baptised in the last four months. Amen. And that's been a great blessing for us as a church. And so as I was thinking about preaching today, my thoughts were drawn to this text here in Ecclesiastes Chapter 12, let me read just the first verse to you again. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. That's really what Amelie is doing. By putting her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and being baptised in obedience and in union with him. Just at age 10, she's remembering her creator in the days of her, use, of her youth. And it's also what her Lord Jesus Christ is asking her to do from this time on. We're not saying, right, that's it, done and dusted. I've remembered my creator, I've been converted, been baptised, that's it now. No, the whole point is, this is what he is asking Amelie to do. From now on, keep remembering her creator while she is young. Don't forget him. Every day, keep him in mind. So it's a text that's very relevant for Emily and other young people. But you might be here and you're thinking, well, hold on a minute. Okay, that's all right for Emily. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. But that isn't for me because the days of my youth are very long ago, some of you might be thinking. It's a long time since I was a young person, or maybe it's a few years since you were a young person. You don't consider yourself particularly a youth anymore. And so I can't obey this command, you think to yourself. I can't remember my creator in the days of my youth. Those days are gone. Or perhaps it might be even a bit more than that. You might be thinking, oh dear, I've just heard this text. Remember your creator while you were young. And I didn't do that. I failed to do that. When I was a young person, I did not remember my creator. I hardly gave him a thought. And, you know, I can never get that back. Maybe you feel like that when you hear this text. <coughs> I want to reassure you if you're thinking things like that. Okay? I want to encourage you. I want you to realise that you still have a great part to play in obeying 
this verse of the Bible and in helping our young people to obey it. You have a role to play because all scripture is useful for all people and in different ways for different people perhaps. But you are being spoken to just as much here. And most of all I want you, everyone, Emily, me, the whole room, I want you to understand that this text is actually giving us hope because it ultimately points us away from ourselves and it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, even the person who is converted at the youngest of ages has been very imperfect in doing what this text tells us to do, to remember our Creator in the days of our youth. No one has done that perfectly. No one has been the ideal youth, apart from one. Just one. Isn't that wonderful news for sinners like us? who have failed to be the young people, the middle-aged people, the old people that we ought to be. We need a saviour who has done this text perfectly, who has obeyed what was demanded of him by the law of God here in Ecclesiastes, for him to remember his creator. He did it perfectly. And we run to him when we know we've failed, or we've missed that part of our lives, or we wish we could get it back. We don't dwell on that, we dwell on him. And we remember all that he's done for us as a young man, just as much as a man more advanced in years. Though, of course, he only got to his 30s himself before he gave his life for us. So, I have a word this morning for Amelie, and you can all listen in. I have a word for all of you, and Amelie can listen in. And then I have a word about the Lord Jesus Christ that will benefit us all. Okay, so those three things, particularly to start with, and a word for Amelie. And all of you need to listen in. Here's the word for Emily. Keep remembering your creator. Keep remembering your creator. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. When the Bible uses that word remember, it doesn't just mean like remembering something like that you might forget, like a a shopping list or like a list. You know, I'm sure Emily won't mind me saying this, but you know, When it's 8 o'clock in the morning, we're saying, have you got your pee kit? Have you got your water bottle? Have you got your lunchbox? Have you remembered those things? And normally Emily has. Very good. But that's not what the Bible is doing when it says remember. It's not just a mental tick list. Oh, uh, you know, remember my socks, remember this, remember that. And remember my creator, I better do that too. It's not saying that. The Bible way of using this word remember goes a lot deeper than that. It's a much more heart and soul commitment we're talking about here. It's actually an interesting word, and it's a word that is used of God, not just that we're to remember our Creator, but that He remembers us. Let me give you one example of that. Remember when God flooded the world, perhaps, in the days of Noah, and after all that rain and all the water has covered the earth and it's destroyed all living things, apart from one family. What are we told in Genesis chapter 8? It says, Then the Lord remembered Noah. Now, that doesn't mean that God was off somewhere else, busy doing something else, and then suddenly think, oh, you know what, there's that guy down there. <laughs> I've forgotten all about him and his family. Oh, there's a lot of water, I, you know, I bet they do something about it. That's not what that means, is it? You know, you kind of instinctively know it doesn't mean that God had kind of forgotten all about him, he was getting on with his business and suddenly um, he remembers Noah. No, no, no. It means, when God remembered Noah, it means God upheld his promise to them. God kept his commitment to them that he'd said, before, I'll bring you through this. And now all the rain has come and all the world is flooded. God says, I'm going to bring you out of the ark and start a new world through you. It's saying God loved Noah. God was on Noah's side. God was for Noah. That's what it means when it says God remembered Noah, not just a a kind of tick list remembering. So when we come back to Ecclesiastes and it says, you now remember your creator in the days of your youth, it's saying, commit yourself to him. Be all in for your creator. Keep your promises to him. Don't forget that you belong to him. Live for him. It's asking you to do that, and I'm saying to Emily, will you do that, Emily? Will you remember your creator in that way? And that, the fact that it uses that word creator is important, not just remember your God, but remember your creator. It's saying, 
remember, Adam and Eve, you did not make yourself. Everyone here, you did not make yourself. You did not make your circumstances. You did not create your own way in life. You did not make your friends. You did not make your parents. You did not make anything that's around you or in you or in your life. Of course, we are still making real choices in the world today, and there are things we are very much responsible for, yet at the same time, ultimately, the person behind all of that, our own bodies, minds, souls, and everything that we are, that's not us. We have a creator, and we're to remember, we are not self-made, but made by someone else. A glorious and great person, infinitely wise and massive, good, strong, faithful, kind, your creator. Remember that your life comes from him. <coughs> Remember that he gave you everything that you have. And he meant to do that because he loves you. And he cares about you. And he wants you to know and follow him all the days of your life. Remember that. Everything he's created you to be. Everything he's created you for you to experience from now on. And before that too. All of that, it's no mistake. It's deliberately, divinely designed. Your body, your mind, your emotions, your abilities, everything you have is from him. It's a gift from your maker to be used for your maker. And of course, his most precious gift of all to you, Emily, to every believer in the room, indeed to everyone in the world, well, if they would come to him, the greatest gift of all is the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> his own son, a saviour for sinners like Emily and her dad. So keep remembering him. And this text is saying the best time to do this for Emily, the best time to do it is now. You're 10 years old. The best time to do it is now. While you are young, the text says, before the days of trouble come. In other words, Emily, before you have to think about stuff like getting a job, okay, or earning money, buying a house, learning to drive, before all these things kind of crowd you, before you have to worry about grown-up stuff, which you might kind of be wanting to get to quite quickly, but don't worry, you know, it'll come. Don't hurry along there, okay? Before those days come, remember your Creator. While your body and your mind still work really well, which they do. While you have more free time than most adults, Remember him now. Now's the time. When you're young. How are you going to do that? Memorise the Bible while your memory works really well when you're a young person. Memorise scripture. Get it in your mind and your heart while you're young. Ask all the questions you want when you're thinking and when you're inquisitive and when you want to understand more. There's no bad question. Just ask all the questions you want as you do them. While you're young, learn about missionaries while you're young. Learn about great women of God that you can follow the example of while you're young. From now, from the past, read, think, pray. Get used to being different for Jesus at school. Because it's just as hard being different for Jesus as a grown-up. And if you don't get that clear in your mind, I'm going to take the knocks. As a young person, I'm going to get used to what it means to sometimes have people laugh at me and make life difficult for me because I say I'm a Christian and I follow Jesus. The earlier you do that, the better. The earlier we say you nail your colours to the mast and say I'm getting used to suffering a bit for Jesus. The earlier you do that, the better. Make that pattern for your life. Be, Emily, the most Christ-like sister you can be. Find your place in this church family. In all those ways and many more, you'll be remembering your Creator. And I've said it to Emily, but I'm saying to all of you to listen. Especially if you are still young. However, wherever you draw the line, okay, on young. Yesterday, you, many of you know, we had our birthday celebration for me and Duncan. Duncan was 50, I was 40, and we had a little party together. And, and one person made a, a wonderful error of uh, giving Duncan my card and giving me Duncan's card. So that now Duncan is 40 and I'm 50. 
So I, you know, I gained 10 years and Duncan lost 10. But wherever you draw the line of youth, remember your creator while you are young. Okay, that's a word for Amelie that you can all listen to. Here's a word for all of you that Amelie can listen into. Help young people remember their creator. Help young people remember their creator. See, see you might be thinking, you know, listening to the last five, ten minutes, thinking, yeah, yeah, okay. Like I said earlier, that's okay for Amelie, you know, but I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm not young, and that, that part of my life is gone. I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 80, I'm 90. Where's, where's the lesson for me here? The days of trouble that this verse talks about have come for me, if you're thinking. This kind of amazing poetic description of old age, which you read from the rest of the first seven verses of Ecclesiastes 12. That's me, you know, I'm getting slower. I'm struggling. When I get ill, I don't bounce back like I used to when I was 10. It takes me weeks. I'm slowed up for days and days. And will I ever kind of be back to how I used to be? Remember your creator. I have trouble remembering what I went upstairs for. <laughs> Some of you are thinking. It's a bit like the story of the little girl who sat on her granddad's lap. And asked him, Grandad, why do you have three pairs of glasses? And Grandad said, well, I have one pair for reading, I have one pair for long distance, and I have one pair to help you find the other two. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, that's generally amusing. But what if, a bit more seriously, you're a granddad or you're a grandma, here yeah, many of you are, what happens if your grandchild comes to sit in your lap and they don't say, Granddad, Grandma, why do you have three pairs of glasses? They say to you, what's your favourite thing? What are you going to say then? Or maybe they're a bit older and they're, they're teenagers. They don't sit on your lap anymore, but they're kind of wrestling with some life choices. and They're in the kitchen and they, they start chatting to you and they say, Granddad, Grandma, I'm just kind of coming up to finishing school. What should I do with my life? They might ask you that, mightn't they? A grandchild might say, maybe younger ones, maybe older ones, might say, Granddad, Grandma, what will happen when you die? Those kind of questions, right, are your opportunity, grandparents, aren't they? That's a great opportunity because you can help those young people that the Lord has entrusted you with you can help them to remember their creator in the days of their youth. You can say, you know what, my favourite thing is sitting down in that chair with my Bible open and listening to God speak to me, and then I get to speak to him too. If that is your favourite thing, of course, I'm not asking you to lie. I'm asking you to cultivate a life of devotion to Jesus where the most natural thing for you to say when they say, what's your favourite thing, is something to do with him. You can say when they ask, well, what will happen when you die? You can say, well, I'll tell you. Thanks for asking. I will see Jesus face to face. And I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that. I hope God gives me years to serve him here. But when that day comes, I'm not afraid. Because I'm looking forward to being with him. When they say, well, what should I be doing with my life? Well, you, you might say all kinds of things that come to you through God's wisdom. But you will say, well, whatever you do, my boy, my girl. Remember your creator. Don't forget you have a creator in what you do with your life. Now, if there's some of you here, right, so I've, I've hit the, the youth, and I've hit the grandparents. So some of you are kind of in the middle, and you're thinking, no, where's a bit for me? Well, this is what the local church is for. It's for every age. It's for grandparents, young people, and everyone in between. You don't have to be a grandparent for this to apply to you, to help Young people, people younger than you, which is everyone about from Amelie, okay? <laughs> Help people younger than you remember their creator in the days of their youth. Older believers, be they 40, 50, 25, 90, whatever you are, you can help younger Christians to remember their creator while they're still young, and especially when you've been lumped together, maybe I should say brought together, gathered together, in a church family like this, where they've got a whole range of angels, which is a wonderful reflection of the the reality of the family of God and Christ dying for all ages and all kinds of people. 
if you think about this, we now have six people under 80 in our membership. We're not a massive church, we're a church of 60 members now. If we've got six people who are under 18, that means that's 10% of the membership are what you'd really call young people, still at school, still learning what it means to follow Christ as a young Christian. If you add in the dozen or so who are still in their 20s or their 30s, which most of you are going to classify as young, then that takes us up to 30% of the church. 30% of the church are young people in that sense. They need to learn how to remember their creator in the days of their youth. Even then, if you never did, or if you look back and you think they were wasted years, but God has been gracious to you in later life, even if you feel, well, I can't obey my creator now in, in, in my youth because I'm not that anymore. Now, you see, because you're in a church family, you've got another chance. You've got a wonderful opportunity to cultivate and help the Christian discipleship of people younger than you here at Grace Baptist Church. So let me be very practical. Which of you women here are going to look out for Amelie or Isla or Naomi, apart from their mums, Take it as a given that their mums are going to look out for them and try and help them spiritually. But which other women here are going to step up and say, you know, I'm just going to ask Miriam how, how that's going. I'm going to ask Emily, Naomi, Isla, how they're getting on. I'm going to ask age-appropriate questions. I'm going to be interested in their life. I'm going to find out how things are going at school. I'm going to love them as a young sister in Christ. Who's going to do that? Who's going to, I hope that if in a year's time I'm still saying no one's done it yet. I hope that won't happen. I hope that some of you women will say, you know, I have a responsibility towards the young female members of this church. Who's going to help those young women and young men, for that matter, through the changes of the teenage years as they face them? When the world wants to squeeze them into its mould, who's going to help them? Who's going to, to, to guide them as they try and navigate those very tricky issues, particularly at school? Let me change from the women to the men. Particularly, which of you men here who has a smartphone is going to help to partner with Julian and pray for and guide Matthias, Phineas and Jonathan to keep their hearts and their eyes pure when they get a smartphone as well? Who's going to do that? Who's going to say, this is a big thing for young men. Let's get that sorted now, partner with Julian and say, let's pray. Let's make it men, godly young men, whose eyes don't look at anything impure. Isn't that, wouldn't that be a great thing to achieve as a church family? Men, step up then for that vital task. Who of you, let me expand it a bit more, who of you who are in your 50s or your 60s are going to get alongside the young couples at Grace, particularly if you are married or have been married and have that experience Who's going to get alongside those young couples in this church and ask them, are you getting enough quality time together to pray together? Are you getting enough quality time together just to be together, go for a walk together, to talk together for half an hour? And if you discover that they're just not getting that time because family life or work life or whatever else is too busy, will you offer to babysit for them for just 30 minutes? So they can do that, so they can get out, so they can get into another room in the house and pray together and read God's word together. Sometimes young couples, parents need that kind of support from other members of the family. Don't let them be kind of secluded and set off in their little house and think, well, they're there now, I don't need to worry about them. They've, they've, got, a, they've got a lovely little family unit. No, they might be under a lot of pressure. Maybe you could do something. You're not going to know unless you ask. Maybe they're doing just fine. Maybe they're not. Which of you who are retired, with all that experience of life as a Christian in the workplace, are going to be a sounding board for younger Christians who are just starting out in navigating the dilemmas and challenges of being a young employee. They don't know how to stand for Christ in the workplace, how to make difficult ethical decisions. But you've been there, you've done that, you've been in the workplace for 40, 50 years. You know what you're doing. Will you help those younger Christians to work that out? I'm saying in all these ways, are you as a church, are we as a church going to help our younger people remember their creator in the days of their youth rather than standing back and letting them make a mess of the days of their youth? This is a church family. We are all in this together. So ask yourself, what am I going to do? I'm asking you, what are you going to do? Right From this point on, after this morning, to help someone younger than yourself 
to remember the Hill Angel is their number one priority. Maybe you need to go home and write down something so you don't just say, yeah, that was a nice message. That was really kind of, yeah, that was pertinent. You, you're not going to do much about it unless you maybe go home and write down. Here's the one thing I can do and I will do in the next month, the next week, the next day that's going to help someone younger than me remember their creator. What are you going to do? Go write it down. Go think about it, pray about it, and get involved in the discipleship of somebody who's younger than yourself. Here's the word then for everyone. Help young people remember their creator. A word for Emily, keep remembering your creator. A word for everyone, help young people remember their creator. And a word now to conclude that was for Jesus that we all benefit from. Because if we don't think about Jesus, we're all just hopelessly lost, aren't we? It's, then it's just life skills, is what I'm doing this morning, not the gospel. And we want the gospel, we want grace in our lives, don't we? We want the Lord Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, to work powerfully among us, and to let us see him, and let us live for him. So here's a word that was for Jesus. You see, the kind of lifestyle I've been describing, you might think, wow, I've never done anything like this before in my life, I'm a hopeless failure. Maybe you think, well, this is, oh, this is too much for me. Maybe you're a younger person and you think, wow, this is a big ask. Remember your creator all the time in the days of my youth. Maybe for older people who have a responsibility for them in the church family that I've been talking about. Maybe you're thinking, well, I've not done this. Maybe you've started very late and you feel guilty about this. Maybe some of you, until about five minutes ago, never even realised that it was your Christian duty and privilege to get involved in the discipleship of somebody younger than yourself. And you're thinking, whoa, new ground. I don't, I've never been there. How do I do this? And I've failed quite a lot. Let me close now then by telling you what you need most. You do not, repeat not, need most to clean up your act. You do not need most to repent. You do not need most to start a new chapter of discipleship. Okay, All those things will be great, and I hope you're convicted to do some or all of them, but that's not what you need most. Okay, What you need most, hearing me this morning, is not a what, but a who. It's who you need most. What you need most is the Lord Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1 was written for Jesus before it was ever written for you. It was written as a command for him to obey. It was written for him in such a way that there would be no leeway, no excuse, no forgiveness if he failed to do it. It was placed upon him as a demand of God's justice, as a demand of God's righteousness, as the requirement of the God who demanded a holy life as a substitute for all our unholy lives. It was written for Jesus. Jesus, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. The Son of God, the Eternal One, took on created flesh. You've got to understand that? Very clear. The Son of God is not a part of creation. From eternity, he is God. He was with the Father in the beginning. He never had a beginning. And yet, the gospel is very clear. That there was a point in the history of our world where he did take on creation, created flesh. He never had a body or a human mind before. And then he did. Why? For his people's sake. So that he could become a fitting and perfect substitute for everyone who has messed up the days of their youth, like you have and like I have. What did Jesus do? Well, we read it in that passage that Andrew read to us earlier in Luke chapter 2. Do you remember? I mean, that's just the one kind of glimmer of a glimpse we have really into the, the life of Jesus when he was about Amelie's age, when he was 12 years old. And we read that story about him in the temple. Remember going to ask the questions and his parents searched for him and, and he says, you know, I had to be in my father's house. But then at the end of that passage, it says in chapter 2 of Luke, verse 52, he grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. That's the youth Jesus, 12 years old, growing in stature, growing in wisdom, growing in favour with God. Oh, wouldn't it be 
just the end of the road if he had grown in this phone room. If he had messed up like any other teenager. But he didn't. He grew in favour with God. There's more and more of the delight of God upon his life as he lived it out before him. So he was obedient to his parents. He says he went down to Nazareth and he was submissive to them. He loved them. He obeyed them. He respected them. He created them. And yet he obeyed them. And yet he put his heavenly father first. Didn't you know I had to be in his house? I had to be about his business? It was always so balanced, wasn't it? So perfectly weighted in his life. 100% respect for his mum and dad, Joseph and Mary. Same time, 100% devotion, love for his heavenly father. I had to be there. I had to be where he is. He loved God with all his heart mind and soul and strength and he loved his neighbour and his friends and his mum and his dad and his brothers and his sisters and everyone else as he loved himself. He was Ecclesiastes 12 in the flesh. He was remembering his creator when he was 12 and when he was 4 and when he was 17 and when he was 26 and when he was 33 exhaling the last moments of his youth with all the weight of our youthful stupidity upon his own shoulders. Taking the awful credit for what we had done so wrong. And now he's offered to you. He's risen in all his glory. He's offered to you in all his eternal, infinite, endless youthfulness now. The risen man, seated on the throne of heaven and come down by his spirit to us to resurrect us to help us live, whether we're 10 or 20 or 30 or 90, however old we are, to help us make disciples of those younger than us, to help us be faithful every moment of our young lives or any other kind of life. He's your creator. He's remembered his creator, and now he calls you to remember him. He's your redeemer, not just creator. For those of you who've put your faith in him and gone through the waters of baptism like Emily, you're saying he's mine, he's rescued me, live like that. Remember him as your redeemer while you still can, with all the time you have left, until he comes again. Let's pray together. Glorious God, our creator, we want to remember you, but we confess we have often forgotten you. And we pray for your forgiveness. Help us to be those who remember our Creator. If we're young, to do it then. If we're older, to help those who are younger to do it. And thank you that Jesus did it perfectly. Thank you he replaces us in every way that we need him to. And comes to live with us, for us. Thank you for his Holy Spirit to give us new lives of obedience. We pray, Lord. That in our failures we wouldn't be despondent. But we remember that Christ <coughs> says again to us, come to me, I'll give you rest. I'll start again with you. I'll start every day fresh. Mercy's new every morning. So we thank you for that. We pray we become a church where younger people are discipled and given godly examples by those who are older than them. We pray that older people would be ready and willing to learn from the insights and energy be helped by that, by the younger people, that together as a church family, we might not be secluded from each other, but one together in Christ. Help us and we pray. Glorify your name for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing um, our closing uh, song, which talks about the, the journey of life, if you like, from youth to old <coughs> age, remembering that God's plans are greater than all of our plans, and we entrust our lives to him. So let's stand to sing who has planned the journey.
dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him and his coming. Amen. Amen. Amen.